Yeah, the project I'm going to, to talk about today is a joint project with uh, Sam Barron. Actually, uh, this project started in Australia. Um, we are basically talking about uh, the problem of extended symbols as we find it in, in philosophy and how this uh, issue would relate to um, the claim that we find uh, in quantum gravity that space-time may be uh, emergent or non-fundamental or, or non-existent. So uh, the question I'm going to uh, ask about today is, is the world made of extended symbols? Right, so here on the left, you have this kind of uh, picture to trigger your intuition pump. Um, very intuitively, the idea is that the world will be made of uncuttable building blocks in the form of uh, either atoms, right? Material extended symbols or space-time quanta, spatial temporal extended symbols. Um, a number of philosophers have argued in favor of extended symbols on the ground that they are needed by fundamental physics. So you also have more a priori arguments, but I, I won't be uh, talking about a prior the prior arguments today, but rather focus on, on uh, physics. And uh, these sorts of arguments typically appeal to theories of quantum gravity. So here are a few examples. Here is uh, Brian Green. Strings are truly fundamental. They are atoms, uncuttable constituents in the truest sense of the ancient Greek. From this perspective, even though strings have spatial extent, the question of the composition is without any content. And here is Craig Callender. On its most natural interpretation, superstring theory posits extended symbols. I say most natural because the theory was initially motivated by the fact that the topology of interacting continuous one dimensional extended entities avoided the ultraviolet divergences that plague graviton graviton scattering. The one dimensionality of strings really is a significant part of the original attraction of the theory. And here is a, a last uh, quote from uh, Brad Rettler. Um, both theories, and here he refers to both loop quantum gravity uh, and string theory, both theories entail the existence of extended symbols. If string theory is true, then there are extended symbols because strings are extended one dimensional symbols. If loop quantum gravity is true, then space is discrete. So its smallest parts, parts sorry, are extended. If an extended symbol fills up some, but not all of an extended region, then there is a part of the region it fills up. And so there are regions smaller than it, but that's impossible. So if loop quantum gravity is true, the smallest things are also extended. Um, but wait, is quantum gravity really pointing in the direction of a discrete space-time uh, and of uncuttable material objects or of uh, the unreality of space-time. And in fact, when you look at the literature uh, on the philosophical side, um, to date, arguments from physics uh, in favor of extended symbols have ignored the fact that the very existence and fundamentality of space-time are put under pressure uh, by quantum gravity and that space-time could be emergent uh, in some sense. So what I'm going to uh, do today is first I will uh, uh, sketch out the situation in contemporary physics from a, a philosophy perspective. I will introduce some physics-based arguments for extended symbols, and then I will assess the arguments against some metaphysical models of the emergence of space-time. Right, so um, the emergence of space-time, actually you, you find it in many uh, places uh, in contemporary physics in one uh, form or another. So different sorts of properties can be um, um, can be denied existence or fundamentality. So for instance, spatial distances or temporal durations in 2D string theory, 10D string theory, causal set theory, uh, Penrose conformal psychic cosmology. I just named those approaches if it rings the bells. If not, uh, that's not a big deal, just um, um, keep in mind the spatial distances uh, and or temporal durations uh, are um, put at risk by some approaches. Uh, spatial and temporal ordering, too, in loop, loop quantum gravity. Uh, a four-dimensional structure from a 10 or 
dimensional structure and, and uh, some approaches to string theory. Uh, the time dimensions, uh, here I'm thinking about uh, the Barbour's version of shape dynamics, uh, on which I think Antonio is, is working. Um, and also a local split between space and time. Uh, in some approach, you find the idea that uh, the separation between uh, of space time in space and time uh, is, is uh, not to be found everywhere. So it's, uh, it's called the Euclidean-Lorentzian shift approach. So uh, many flavors of, of what could be missing of space and time or both. Um, today, we just talk about string theory and loop quantum gravity. Um, and describe that, them in very uh, rough terms, just to, um, to give you enough content to then go back to extended simples. So string theory is the most popular approach to quantum gravity. Um, by this, I mean in, in number of physicists involved uh, and is often presented as a prospective final theory of everything. Uh, the view describes a world made of one dimensional entities, the strings, sometimes brains, uh, <clears throat> and those strings are incredibly tiny and rigid and may oscillate with various frequencies, giving rise to phenomena that we then categorize as the particles and fields in our less fundamental series, um, GR and QFT, on which the standard model particle uh, physics is based. So it is to start from the standard model uh, of particles, seeks to recover gravity, via the view that gravitational interactions are mediated by a particle, the graviton, which is then reduced to a particular state of a string. Um, but here is the thing. Um, what's quite interesting, and here I'm, I will be relying heavily on the work of Nick Huggett um, and other philosophers of physics working on, on, on duality in string theory. Uh, the four-dimensional space-time is also replaced by another structure made of 10 dimensions. And those added dimensions are curled up on themselves. Uh, compactified uh, is a fancy word. So the four space time dimensions then have to emerge somehow from the 10D uh, structure. So now um, a naive understanding would be to say, well, look, there is no problem of space time emergence here at all. Um, it's just that really the additional dimensions are compactified. We just fail to notice them when we uh, zoom out. Um, but it's just that we are basically changing our, our understanding of what space-time is. But um, it's quite tricky to understand what the ontology uh, of string theory. Uh, it's just a research program with no completely sorted out ontology. And the best thing we have uh, at the moment are five perturbative superstring series that rely on 10D structures. And the models of the series and here by model, I mean uh, the solutions, the different solutions of uh, each of those five series um, have, have um, uh, entertained a lot of different relations and uh, notably some relations of um, physical equivalence. So there is something a bit uh, strange uh, here and the strangeness comes from the fact that we have those relations of duality between the different models of the different series. And so we have really a network of different series that seem to be able to um, allow us to cash out GR um, via different routes. Uh, and this network of dual series has to be related uh, not only to a more fundamental non-perturbative M series, more fundamental, uh, which is still has to be found uh, and fully understood, but also to GR space time, right? So it's really a three levels picture. You have uh, the, the fundamental M theory, uh, the super string series, and then we want to have GR and QFT from that. So of course, uh, it's not clear what the metaphysical status uh, of the duality, why it's the case that we observe of the, sorry, that we observe those relations between the different models of the different series. Um, and probably we don't we won't know until we actually have a fully worked out M series that will explain why uh, we had the uh, the web, uh, this web of, of of superstring series in the first place, right? All of that assuming, of course, that it would be possible to find an M theory, right? It's of course the possibility that um, um, that string series are are, are wrong headed. 
But that would be the hope, right? To find a more fundamental theory that will help us to understand why we were uh, um, facing those uh, uh, relations of duality between different uh, theories. And the thing is, uh, the spaces on which strings live, right? In the sense that they are indexed to each specific superstring theory. Uh, they cannot be identified with just space time, although they are formulated against uh, 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 by using the notion of a relativistic uh, uh, space time. So it's what uh, Nick Huggett argues uh, for, for instance. And so, according to a popular understanding of duality, and here by a popular, um, I should be careful because here uh, what I should say really is popular among philosophers of, of physics working on string theory. Um, popular approach is a common core approach, and the idea is that the M theory will be based on the structure common to all dual series, and that this uh, common core will not include your space time. Um, so, of course, we do not know the core, uh, neither mathematically nor ontologically. Uh, it's really more like um, um, some kind of speculation. Um, but the idea is that the target space on which the strings are, are, are living, are, are, uh, they, all those target spaces seem to be artifacts of the specific superstring theory which is used to describe the core. Right, so just to give you a feel about uh, why even in string theory uh, could be the case that space time uh, might be missing, which is a bit, a bit less a knowledge uh, that in the case of, of loop quantum gravity. All right, so uh, not to loop quantum gravity. Um, a little bit um, um, terrified to speak about that in front of Carlo Rovelli, but I'll try to do my best. <laughs> um, so here the idea is that LQG starts with uh, general relativity and aims to provide a, a quantum account of the gravitational field with the hope of reconciling it uh, with the quantum fields of the standard model uh, down the track. And the fundamental posits, uh, the, the fundamental stuff which are posited by the theory, uh, are represented by networks of intersected loops called spin networks. Uh, those spin networks can be represented by undirected graphs, uh, basically a structure of nodes connected by edges. And exactly what those nodes and edges represent is, is, is quite controversial. But one possibility, um, we have to, to start somewhere, and, and, and one possibility is that actually each node is a spin network, um, in a spin network, sorry, represents a 2D spatial surface, and every edge represents a 3D spatial volume. So a group of nodes and edge can then represent uh, an atom of space, just like a cube can be represented as a two-dimensional net. And in the dynamical form of LQG, spin networks are replaced by spin forms on extrusion of the spin network structure through a higher uh, dimension. As with the spin network structure, it's controversial to exactly how um, spin forms should be physically interpreted. So here we have a, a basically just to a more realist account of, of, of space time. Um, and so here the idea will be that, well, the spin form really represents a lattice of spatial temporal atoms. That would be one way to go. And as usual in quantum series, uh, many fundamental classical quantities are substituted by operators in LQG, giving us output discrete values. So importantly for our purpose, errors and volumes are treated as operators entailing that volumes and errors can only take discrete values, thereby offering, also it seems, reasons uh, to interpret LQG as relying on an ontology of discrete entities, right? And already here we can see that uh, discrete entities could be a path to uh, um, extended symbols. So there is an important conceptual gap between GR and LQG, uh, actually uh, several. GR is continuous and classical, while the fundamental structure of LQG with its quantum operators appears to be uh, discrete and quantum. Um, there are also, also other uh, funny uh, business going on, but I, I wanted to talk about them here. 
Um, what I want to bring your attention to right now is um, that we can think of two different sorts of discreteness. And it's quite important to keep this distinction in mind when you want to look at uh, the concept of extended simple. So the first notion is uh, topological discreteness or discreteness T, as I will call it later. And here is the idea that uh, space time is discrete in this sense when there are space time points that are isolated. Um, so there is a neighborhood around each point that contains no other space time points. Um, and so space time will be constituted by these points. Um, so notice all in this approach, all extended regions have proper parts, right? Namely the points that constitute them. So if that the sense in which space time is discrete, then uh, the case for extended simple regions is dead on arrival, right? Because uh, the, the space time regions just have points as proper parts. But there is another uh, sense of discreteness, which is a region-based discreteness notion. Uh, here's the idea that there are no space-time points, really. Uh, what you have are extended space-time regions that have no proper subregions, right? So here, each, each um, do you actually see my uh, pointer when I move it? Yeah, OK, great. Um, so for instance, if you take this space-time region, right, uh, it does not have any uh, proper subregion. That's the idea of uh, this sense. But you don't have points, really, right? It's more like you have a collection of chunks. Uh, and here is the idea that one option would be that, well, those minimal regions will be the building blocks of space time. And if space time is discrete in this sense, then space time is made of spatial temporal extended symbols, right? That's one way, uh, one possible way to go. Right, so now uh, let me give some arguments for uh, extended simples. So they are more like shape of arguments. Uh, one possibility will be that, well, uh, perhaps we, will, we are going to be very lucky and there will be a direct way to argue, to argue from physics to extended simples uh, because we have a situation where we just have a given physical theory T, which posits some entity X that is both extended and neurologically simple. Uh, and then a realist commitment to that theory, right? So you have independent reasons to think that the theory is correct, uh, will be sufficient to uh, get an ontological commitment to be um, entitled to believe in the existence of extended simples. So call these a simple argument, simple argument for extended simples. Um, but we can think also a more indirect way to do for extended simples which will be to basically um, argue for extended simple uh, from situations where a theory does not directly posit an entity X that is merogically simple and extended. So realism about the theory, right? Accepting the ontological commitment of the theory will not be enough to accept uh, extended simples. So a case we have then to be made that we can infer the simplicity of some entity posited by the theory by, combi by combining realism about the theory uh, with one or more plausible principles that go beyond the content of that physical theory, right? Some philosophical principles or perhaps methodological principles, something like that. Um, and in the paper, uh, the, 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 the principle that we consider is uh, what's called the harmony principle we take from Socido, but it's quite uh, common. And the idea that X is a proper part of Y, if at, and only if X uh, location is a proper subregion of Y's location. So what does it mean in a picture? Uh, the idea is that, um, so consider on the left here, you have uh, an object, right? Um, uh, uh, which has P, as a proper part, right? So here, uh, the um, capitalized P is referred to proper parts. So the idea is that P is a proper part of, of the uh, object E. Um, here we have a region R with L star being a, a proper subregion this time of R. 
And so you can see that we can have mirage correlations both for objects on the one hand and for uh, space or space time on the other hand. And so in philosophy, you have a whole literature about harmony principles about the fact that um, usually uh, the two mirological structures are supposed to, to be the same, right? So the idea is that location will ensure the harmony of the two mirological structure because if, um, if the object uh, is located at R and it has a property, a proper part P, this proper part P will have to be located at the proper subregion R star. Right, so it's really the idea that uh, the two um, marriages will be structurally identical. And so this is kind of uh, arguments, right? So, I mean, here I didn't put the argument that is, uh, because it's a bit more technical that we find in the paper, but um, the idea is that you can argue for something being an extended simple, uh, an object being an extended simple by looking at how it's, it's uh, located in space and the properties of, of the space uh, and, and, um, and the internal structure of the space, roughly that's, this, that's um, the idea. So you can have two sorts of arguments, right? Direct and less uh, direct arguments. Um, and they are usually, uh, as we saw, aimed at series like uh, LQG and string theory. But of course, to come back to what I said at the beginning, uh, extended simples, however, presuppose a viable notion of spatial temporal extension, right? So for determining whether physics implies extended simples, we first need to determine the status of space-time in the context of quantum gravity uh, and of extension, right? And now I'm going to basically uh, gesture um, a classification of, of metaphysical models of the emergence of space-time. Um, so maybe there are more, actually it's more like my own way to, to think about this, uh, also working with Sam, how we managed to, to basically agree on, on, on some big families of metaphysical views about the linkage between space-time and, and a non-spatial temporal ontology. So of course, the first approach is space-time eliminativism, right? It's quite radical, radical approach. You just claim, well, space-time does not exist at all. It's not fundamental, meaning it does not exist, full stop. And rather, instead of that, what exists is some non-spatial temporal structure. Um, I think it should be obvious that space-time eliminativism undermines the case for extended simples entirely, right? Because if you don't have space-time, you won't have extension. Or at the very least, uh, I mean, maybe there is room for arguing that you can have a form of non-spatial temporal extension that will be a bit more um, exotic and not indexed to our ordinary space or to the space-time of GR, uh, but it won't be easy. So if space-time does not exist, then nothing is extended. And so no simple is extended, roughly that's the line of thought. Um, it's probably not a very uh, attractive view for most people, space-time eliminativism. Actually, Sam is defending it. It convinced me that it's a quite more appealing view that, uh, than what I usually, um, what I used to think. Uh, it's more palatable than I used to think. And I think there may be interesting connections to do with um, the philosophy of Kant, of Immanuel Kant uh, out there. But that's probably not the mainstream view if there is anything like a mainstream view of, of what uh, the emergence of space-time would be. Uh, a second approach, I will talk a bit more about it, is full-blown realism. Uh, and here is the idea that space-time exists all the way down after all. Um, so it goes a bit against the spirit of uh, the space-time emergence claim, right? I mean, maybe that would be the case that a I mean, it could be the case that the conservative theory of quantum gravity with respect to the existence of space-time will turn out to be correct. Um, I don't want to bet on that. To be sure, I'm just trying to explore um, the logical space of how to interpret uh, the situation. So here's the idea that space-time exists really um, all the way down. Um, so there are no non-spatial temporal concrete entities at all. 
and everything is spatiotemporally spatial temporally located. Space time that, that exists at all levels of description, including the most fundamental levels to be described by the theory of quantum gravity. Um, so I think it's quite clear that it would be the most straightforward word road to extended symbols, right? You will go basically against the spirit of the idea that space time could be emergent and say, no, no, it's, it's still there, it's, it's discrete. And so we will have a road to uh, extended symbols. Um, so let's look at both string theory and LQG in this uh, background of the full blown realist uh, approach. Um, so I won't say a lot of things about strings because there I think that the case is not overall uh, compelling, but let me say a few things. So first, we have, we don't have many papers on this topic, but one important paper is by Baker, who provides compelling reasons to suppose that the strings do have parts. He said because they can be split and joined. And indeed, splitting and joining is what we will expect of composing, composite objects and not really of simples. Um, although actually some, some people like um, uh, Roberto Cassetti, Achille Bartzi have suggested that it makes sense to think of the concept of uh, a topological catastrophe, but I will put that on, on the side and just, um, I, won't, I won't discuss this here. But uh, following Huggett and Norton, uh, we note in the paper that it relies on a straightforward but particular interpretation of string theory namely that the splitting process uh, is one in which a single string is divided into parts. But another interpretation is quite natural. It could be that the process of splitting is really the annihilation of one string followed by the creation of two uh, other numerically distinct strings that bear no numerical connection to the original string. Um, and also note that um, those strings and this behavior of strings are based on the super strings series that are um, non-fundamental theories, right? So it's quite difficult to, to trust them. And also, I mean, they come from the use of, of Feynman diagrams in QFT. So um, it's not that clear that we can, we could mount a direct argument for the simplicity or complexity of strings uh, in a direct way like this. So we just conclude that there is no, even if you consider that string theory has a space time uh, occupied by strings, there is no reason to accept that um, this physics speaks in favor of uh, material extended symbols at the moment. All right, uh, now to discrete, uh, the discrete space time of LQG. Uh, it's more, I think it's more interesting and more, uh, um, um, difficult to discuss, to navigate, navigate because there are many uh, little pieces uh, of this puzzle. Um, but the idea overall is that, uh, as we saw, um, it's, it's a possibility that space-time will just be a lattice of space-time atoms. But just to remind you, um, is not how are we going to settle the debate about uh, which sort of discrete structure space-time has? Uh, if that's the case. So that's the first hurdle that would have to be um, to be done um, to, to argue from full-blown realism about space-time in LQG to extended symbols. Um, right, so what I just say, the structure may correspond to a network of isolated space-time points. And also another point to mirror the situation in string theory, um, in the spin form approach, uh, it seems that it includes operations for splitting and joining nodes and edges. Um, so it's unclear whether nodes and edges represent extended symbols, right? We could have again the same um, discussion as the one that um, happened between um, Baker, um, uh, Huggett, and Norton. And also here are just uh, notes that apparently some physicists disagree that the LQG space-time is discrete. Um, so I don't know about the details of that, to be honest, but I just uh, want to um, acknowledge that there is some debate about uh, this uh, discreteness uh, of the LQG space-time. 
Right, so now let's, let me just uh, conclude on this part about full-blown realism, right? The moral to be drawn here is that even if you consider that string theory or LQG will be realist views about space-time at the fundamental level with no emergence of space-time, even if you consider that, uh, we could have thought that it would be um, easy to go from there to extended simples one way or another, but in fact, that's not the case. Um, the situation is too, too com complicated. You have to add many uh, philosophical hypotheses to the physics itself to get to extended simples. Right, so now I move to more uh, perhaps exotic metaphysical models of, um, of the non-fundamentality of space-time. So this one is my favorite, neurological space-time realism. And that's the view that uh, space-time is actually literally composed of non-spatial temporal entities. Um, it's a member of a broader class of views according to which space-time exists despite not being a basic positive, positive theory of QG. Um, I uh, yes, just to be no, I, I won't talk about string theory anymore. We we'll just focus on, on LQG because I think that's uh, the only, I mean, we think uh, that's the only series that really deserves those discussions because we take the case to have, be or, to have already been settled against uh, extended simples from string theory. So just be talking about LQG from now on. Um, so in LQG, the idea will be, to give you an idea, that it will be that the nodes and edges of spin networks do not represent a spatial temporal structure. Instead, the nodes and edges in a spin networks are interpreted as non-spatial temporal building blocks of space-time. Um, because of this interpretation, the spin network structure is taken to describe the parts of space-time, a realist commitment to LQG is taken to imply realism about space-time as well via this neurological connection, right? So it's really, you have different layers. You have, you have one layer where you don't have space-time, a layer of, of description, and you have a higher level of description where you have space-time. Um, and then the simple argument for regions can be applied in two places in this framework. It can either be applied to the spin network structure, or it can be applied to the spatial temporal holes that the spin network structure composes. So uh, it won't work, of course. I mean, the trouble with the first option is that even if the parts of space-time are simple, they are not spatial temporary extended, right? Because you are relating non-spatial temporal parts uh, to spatial temporal holes. Um, although they may compose extended regions. So they are not extended simple regions. Right? Then the trouble with the second option is that according to meritical space and realism, all spatial temporal regions have parts, right? They are composed of non spatial temporal uh, building blocks. So there is no obvious way to make a case for extended simples via realism about LQG alone, even if you already assume this broad metaphysical view of uh, meritical space time realism. Uh, could we have an indirect agreement based on a harmony? Well, not really, because here H seems to be false, right? The harmony principle is just false. It's not the case that X is uh, a part of Y if and only if X location is a subregion of Y's location, right? It's because you basically, uh, if you are a merogical space time realist, basically you broke, you, 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 you just, have broken the um, merogical harmony between space and, uh, and merogy in general. Indeed, because the non-spatial temporal parts of spatial temporal regions are not themselves located at any spatial temporal region, they are not located at any sub-region of space-time. Um, but we think that an argument for harmony can be revived in a way, in a minimal way, by introducing another kind of neutral merogy that does not need to be spatial temporal, uh, that we call in the paper neutral merogy. 
and that in previous works uh, I called transcategorical uh, merogy. And the idea basically is that, is that you can disconnect merogy, all our intuitions about parts and holes and composition from spatial temporality. And um, spatial temporal merogy, parts, uh, holes, composition just become a particular case of a broader, more general framework in which um, merogical concepts do not have to be um, spatial temporal in all, in all uh, circumstances. So the thought is that it's only spatial temporal merogical relations to which harmony principles apply, right? So you have a almost like a threshold at which point um, you, you, you get back the uh, harmony between uh, the merogy of objects and the merogy of, of, of space. But below this threshold, you can still have a, a form of neutral merogy where things are not spatial temporal, right? Roughly that's the picture. So how many principles will then not be constraints on merogy, merogy, sorry, more generally, uh, and will not apply to neutral merogy, just to particular spatial temporal cases of, of neutral merogy that will be uh, spatial temporal merogy. So first, spatial temporally located objects are then related by spatial temporal merogical relations. And these relations obey harmony principles, as I said. And second, space-time itself is merogically composed of more fundamental non-spatial temporal entities to be specified by a, a theory of quantum gravity. And these merogical relations are, are neutral merogical relations, right? Um, so we have a second paper where basically we explore uh, the conceptual and, and formal uh, uh, properties, or, or, or at least we sketch out those properties of such a more minimal form of merogy, which is not spatial temporal. Uh, we have to let go many intuitions, many common sense intuitions we have about what's merogy, that's for sure. Um, but we also think that it's quite nice actually to keep some of the intuitions we have about intuitions, sorry, some of the intuitions we have about um, context in which uh, space and time are missing, right? Because we can, it allows us to make some kind of sense of how um, we get some structures there, even though it's not uh, uh, space time and even though it's not the full deal, the full standard uh, theory of neurology, right? So we like this continuity between this more minimal neutral merogy and the more common sense based uh, form of, of uh, merogy. So if you, I mean, that's a lot to accept. I mean, of course, uh, that's my own uh, um, attempt to try to, um, to, to understand things that are quite difficult to understand. Um, but if you go uh, in that direction, uh, the distinction between neutral and special number merogy will present an opportunity to different, differentiate between different ways for a region of space-time to be simple, right? Because it can be uh, neutrally simple uh, in the sense that it has no proper neutral parts. Um, so maybe I should just give you a small, a, a quick example about what neutral merogy would be just to trigger your intuition pump because it's probably quite difficult to make sense, right? So. Um, Personally, where I come, so I came to develop those views by looking at the work of uh, philosopher, um, the philosopher Laurie Paul. And it comes from a particular view about the nature of objects, of just regular objects like tables and chairs. And it's called the merogical bundle theory. And very roughly, the idea is that an object, instead of being uh, a sum of atoms uh, with relations be between those atoms, it's in fact a sum of properties, right? So you can basically think of the chair as the sum of its shape, its color, um, its location. So even location, sp spatial locations are treated as primitive locations, uh, primitive properties that are um, proper parts of objects, right? So that's a funny way to look at the world. But maybe that's a kind of funny way of looking at the world that we need to try to um, organize a bit uh, uh, to, to make sense a bit of the complex ontology of non-spatial temporal ontologies, right? So that's the idea behind uh, neutral 
composition that basically you can combine different sort of stuff that are not necessarily material. Uh, just like in, you can just like you can build up an object from its properties. Right, so that would be a neutral um, simplicity. Then you have more classical uh, spatial temporal simplicity, not having spatial temporal parts. And if you have those two notions, you can have something which is kind of maximally simple, not having either uh, neutral parts or uh, spatial temporal parts. Um, if you accept this distinction, I mean, again, that's a big if, right? But uh, bear with me. Then you can uh, formulate uh, a concept of, of uh, what we call the complex simple, right? Uh, in order to underline its ambiguous nature with respect to the standard debate of the extended simples. Because complex simples will be neutrally complex, right? That so will have some kind of, of, of um, parts, right? You can speak, think of um, nodes and edge, edges, I don't know, um, being neutral parts of a space time relation, or perhaps a space time point, depends on what you want to have in your ontology at the GR level. Um, but, um, but what are we going to say if, if the world has entities like this, right? If the world is made of uh, complex simples, are complex simples extended simples in the strictest sense or in any sense at all? Well, um, we could assume that complex simples are extended simples or almost stipulate that the case by introducing a notion of non-spatial temporal extension to be then clarified by saying, well, look, those um, complex simples, they have a neutral complexity. So perhaps we can think of this neutral complexity as a form of, um, of non-standard extension, something like this. Um, or we could decide that complex simples differ too greatly from the standard notion of extended simples to categorize them as extended simples, thereby underlining the neutral complexity. Um, so if for the sake of argument, we suppose that complex simples are extended simples, then under this supposition and under the supposition of merogical space-time realism, we'll have a potential path from physics to extended simples, right? But I, I hope I at least convinced you that there is no straightforward world. Uh, there is a lot of uh, assumptions you have to, to make on the way to get there. Um, how am I going with time? Uh, You're okay, you can go ahead. You still have uh, four minutes. Uh, you, you can make it eight if you want. Okay, that's great, thanks. Um, the last uh, approach I want to talk about is uh, what I call derivative realism. Mm, I think that it's a quite popular view. I mean, it's quite difficult to know exactly how a uh, different person thinks about metaphysical issues related to the metrics of space-time. Um, but I, at, at least I think some people have views in the vicinity of, of derivative realism. And the idea will be that, uh, so first it's, it's a member of the broader class of views that takes time, space time, that takes space time to exist, right? Not, despite not being fundamental, just like the view uh, I described before, right? So basically you have a non-spatial temporal ontology, you have a spatial temporal ontology, you are realist about both, both sorts of entities, you accept all of that. But in this case, you posit a different relation between the two, sort of entities, right? In the previous case, it was a relation of composition. And here is the idea is to replace this relation of composition by a relation of primitive grounding, right? So it's not a relation of composition, it's something else, a bit more primitive, difficult to uh, articulate, but it's not composition. Um, and in this view, um, on this view, space-time it's grounded in a range of non-spatial temporal entities described by the theory of, of quantum gravity. So I said perhaps it's more natural than uh, the previous uh, approach I described because many people think that um, mm, uh, analyzing the emergence of space-time in terms of composition is a non-starter, 
because composition is already essentially spatial temporal. But I think that's not true, right? Because if you look at the history of uh, standard mirrorology, it can also be applied to abstract entities. So there is nothing like um, an essential attachment of, of mirrorology to, um, to uh, spatial temporal spatial temporality. Um, but anyway, I should be talking about derivative realism and I'm again trying to defend the neurological view. Um, so let me try to get back on track uh, with this view. Uh, if you think that you have those two almost autonomous, uh, I mean, it's not autonomous, but um, the relation isn't really explanatory between the two levels because it's primitive grounding. Um, then um, it's not clear that we will be able to mount an argument for the existence of extended simples because, um, right, since you can ask, is your space time, your GR space time, is it really continuous as posited by GR? Or do we, should we have another um, ontology which is uh, discrete? So you can only talk in a way about extended simples at the level of, 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 uh, of GR. And it's hard to understand how you are going to uh, move from discrete entities at the level of quantum gravity to extended simples at the level of GR. If you really think that the connecting relation between the two realms, if you really believe that this relation is a primitive relation, um, it's unclear how you're going to um, extract the discreteness from the quantum gravity level to, um, to the discreteness of, of, of uh, GR. I mean, maybe it can be done, but it's not that uh, straightforward. Again, you will have to do a bit of philosophical work to uh, cash out your extended simples uh, in this framework. So just to... Um, to sum up on um, derivative realism, the case for extended simple regions based on a derivative realist approach to LQG can just be made, right? Uh, but you will have to accept a few things, right? The discreteness of space time, as always. Uh, you will have to accept the existence of this primitive grounding relation. And um, of course, um, maybe it's, I, I'm not saying that the world doesn't work like this. Again, I'm just, it's really an epistemological claim. I'm just claiming that the physics alone um, does not speak uh, in favor of the existence of extended simples uh, in this framework, right? And not to conclude, if we zoom out uh, completely, right? I'm sorry, there are many different pieces uh, of my presentation, but the point I'm trying to make is really an overall epistemological claim. Um, First, it's unclear whether series like LQG and string theory posit space time enough for simples to exist, right? So that's the first question to be settled. Second, it's only when we couple the series to a view on the existence of space time that the case for extended simples can be made, right? You have to make many assumptions. So at best, one can mount a conditional argument if the metaphysics of the physics is in a certain way, right? Or if the ontology of the physics is in a certain way, then the physics implies the existence of extended simples. But then it's not the physics alone that implies the existence of extended simples. Right? And on this, uh, I will stop. Thank you very much for your attention. So uh, let's start. The first person in line is Francesca Vidotto. Francesca, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Baptiste, for uh, the presentation. I think you are uh, indeed trying to discuss a point that uh, raises a lot of uh, confusion. And uh, I would like to, to make uh, two comments. Uh, one is about uh, philosophy and one is about uh, uh, physics, strictly. And let me start by the one uh, that is more uh, philosophical related to the metaphysical picture uh, that um, um, that is associated uh, with uh, uh, the notion of uh, um, simple. And <laughs> there is something that uh, um, I, I have difficulty to understand uh, uh, in this discussion. Uh, 
because uh, it seems to me that this notion of simple uh, um, is somehow inadequate uh, to discuss uh, the fundamental level of reality and uh, discuss uh, properties uh, of this uh, fundamental level of reality in the sense that um, the moment in which we discuss properties uh, uh, such as uh, the extension, uh, since, uh, such as uh, area uh, or volume, uh, those properties are always uh, relational. So this means that uh, uh, you cannot discuss them as being associated uh, with uh, a single simple, uh, but they always require a multitude, a plurality of uh, uh, objects being there, or at least they require some kind of partition of your wall into subsystems. So, and uh, this is particularly true when we talk about quantum gravity in the sense that uh, uh, the, this kind of relationality and uh, the, the fact that properties uh, um, such as um, uh, from uh, um, spin on energy or whatever you wanted to discuss, they are always associated with uh, a partition of systems or, or uh, if you want uh, with the presence of uh, an observable, it seems to me um, uh, central in this discussion. So this is uh, um, the first point I wanted to make that is more uh, philosophical, metaphysical. And uh, uh, can, can I take this one already? Would be easier yeah, to yeah, sure. Thanks a lot. Um, so am I right that in what you say, you are supposing that uh, simplicity cannot apply to relations, but only to uh, objects? Is that what you were suggesting? Uh, maybe I am. I, I need to understand better uh, uh, what you what is meant by uh, a... right. So so I guess simplicity in the. Uh, standards, I mean, at least in the sense I was using it, and I guess probably quite standard is uh, a lack of parts, right? So now if you are saying, well, look, only objects or space-time regions are the kind of things that can have parts or not having parts. Uh, and so it's not relevant because uh, I am dealing not with objects or space-time regions, but with relations or properties. And thus sort of entities are not the kind of entities that have uh, that can have or not have parts, right? That's what you were. Uh, I'm, is it what am I making justice to what you said? I. Um, it's. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe you're formulating, you're making it even more clear than what I had. This is a possible way to see it. That mm -hmm. it, yeah. So what okay. what would be the answer in this case? <laughs> Well, so my answer in this case will be that um, I, I personally think that you can disconnect uh, merology from um, um, spatial temporality. And if you do this move, you can also disconnect uh, merology. So we talk about parts and holes. Uh, and um, 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 from the, sorry, let, let me put it in another way. You can, think of uh, simple and complex entities that are not objects or space-time regions, right? For instance, you can think that a, religion, uh, a relation sorry, can be more or less complex because of the num number of relata it has. Uh, I mean, perhaps we, we need some, perhaps we have some mathematics that will be quite uh, complex and will give us reasons to believe that we are using relations that have many, um, um, complex formal properties. Uh, so it's a bit of a stretch, of course, to think of those of all those information as being parts of the entity we are considering, right? Uh, so of course there is a cost for for doing this, for thinking that even relations can have parts, or even the properties can have a part, right? Uh, it's a bit weird, but that's the kind of weirdness I try to um, find to to link. Uh, the, the level of QG, the non-spatial temporal level, let's say, to, to the spatial temporal level, right? But, but if you think of a, a property of um, a dispositional property, right? In philosophy, sometimes people talk about uh, uh, the property of something to manifest itself in a certain way. Well, maybe you can 
think of the target manifestation as a part of the property, right? So that's a kind of a bit conceptual breakthrough I'm after. And of course, it's not intuitive. It's not yeah, um, the usual way to think about composition. But why I'm suggesting this is because then you can uh, perhaps, I mean, the hope is then you can uh, migrate from this to the more ordinary composition of, of spatial temporal stuff. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. The, I, I, I like the move. Uh, the, what I don't see fully realized, uh, it seems to me, but maybe I, I have just to, to understand it better, is uh, the fact that you're saying, okay, I wanted to um, go away from um, um, disconnect the notion of uh, uh, simple from uh, the spatial temporality. But the problem is that uh, the what you can say about uh, space and time is in itself uh, one of these simple. <laughs> it's uh, one of itself one of the properties is uh, one of the relations that you are discussing. Mm -hmm. so, well. Right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what to add, what I said. I mean, um, um, I think if you accept there are different sorts of, of uh, I mean, you can say something like, well, look, this, this spa spatial relation uh, is, uh, spatially simple in the sense that it has no special part. I mean, it's, uh, it seems trivially false because, uh, I mean, and then it depends about your ontology of spatial relations, right? But let me, maybe you can pinpoint some uh, primitive, simple spatial relation with no special parts. Okay? You cannot, right? And, and, but then this will be consistent with saying that it has no special parts, but it has some sort of other parts, right? Maybe uh, your nodes and edges in your spin form um, structure, right? So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess then you will have to plug the physical story, right? To have the details about the table, about how you move from one to the other. So what I'm trying is to find a, a notion that will make a bit of conceptual sense of, of the relation between the two. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's not perfect, of course, it's just an attempt. If you allow me also to go into my the second point uh, that was more uh, concrete related to the physical theory that you are presenting that is loop quantum gravity. Um, uh, one of the two you, that you discussed. Um, one has to be very careful discussing uh, discreteness because in the theory there are two different notions of discreteness. Uh, one is the genuine quantum discreteness uh, and I don't think that there is uh, any, uh, mm, I mean, uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, debates that you were uh, uh, mentioning in your talk were related to another kind of discreteness. Uh, that is uh, the discreteness that, that, that could be associated to the auxiliary structures that we use uh, in order to describe uh, the quantum states uh, uh, of the gravitational fields. And uh, this, so there is on one hand the genuine quantum discreteness that is one that is associated with measurements, uh, with uh, results of uh, hypothetical quantum measurements. So you get area volumes, et cetera, that have a discrete, discrete spectrum, and this is clear. Another kind of discreteness uh, appears when you discuss the states. Uh, and uh, originally, in fact, uh, the, the loop states of the theory were not discrete states. They were not uh, states uh, that uh, were implementing uh, a uh, lattice uh, structure. So the lattice structure that you see in, or the graph structure that you see in uh, the speed network states, uh, it's something that uh, it's extremely useful, uh, but it's not uh, uh, pivotal in the mm -hmm. definition of the theory. And one can use the, the old loop states, one can use the spin network states. So this is not the core of the theory and the core of the theory is the one that brings you the quantum discreteness, I would say. So, and once you realize this, uh, 
talking so you don't want to talk about the discreteness and the parts uh, in the speed networks because this is just a an accessory, an auxiliary structure, you want to talk about uh, the genuine quanta that are there that appears by in the measurements, mm -hmm. in the interactions. Right. So, um, so thanks to that. I mean, it's very helpful. So, uh, so, so what would be your recommendation for me to, if I want to, um, to dig further and try to find a more relevant piece uh, in LQG for uh, Looking at this question, you mean uh, literature um, or um, yeah, or, or the concept? If 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 that's not uh, the spin networks or the spin forms. Uh... Um, well, the the the, the, the concept is the, the fact that there, there is this this distinction, and this is something that Carlo has uh, clarified, for instance, in a paper that is. Uh, um, title uh, Diff Invariance, uh, sorry, DIT Invariance from uh, Bianca Dietrich. And this is also discussed in our uh, book together and in other places. But for instance, uh, something that, that I can recommend you just to take a look, um, uh, I mean, not just looking at the very old, uh, uh, the very old formulations of the loop states by Carlo and, uh, and, and Lee, but also, for instance, uh, some recent work by um, Wolfgang Wieland, uh, in which he is using again uh, the, the old uh, loop states that are uh, continuous, they don't make use of the spin network. And these are just the different representations of different states, but they, they all live in the, in the theory. They are all part of the theory, of the common theory. Right. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Next in line, we have uh, Carlo Rovelli. Carlo. Myself. Okay. I think I'm unmuted. So, uh, 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 yeah. Baptiste, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I, uh, I I really enjoyed. I really learned, and I thought you were you were very careful and. Uh, um, and, and very thoughtful in presenting things. I have uh, three questions if I if I have time, and then uh, uh, Antonio, kill me if I if I'm over o overdoing this. Two are probably um, faster, uh, so I I, I I leave the the uh, the one which is more discussion last. Uh, so the first is is just a complete it's only a detail, but I I I. I and, and, and I apologize for that. At, at some point you said, uh, uh, when you introduced uh, uh, the, the, the discreteness of the nodes and the, and the, the spin network, uh, you said uh, uh, nodes are, uh, are naturally associated to two dimensional surfaces. If design me understood that, that didn't, I, I missed that point. And your presentation was all totally comprehensible to me, very clear from the physical point of view. But why do you say the nodes associated to two dimensional things? In my, uh, I mean, the usual way of saying is that nodes of spin network are associated, say, this, just a rough picture, with three-dimensional regions, and then uh, links to the uh, two-dimensional faces that bound three-dimensional regions. Mm -hmm. did, did you have something else in mind? No, no, no. I mean, I was just being imprecise. Oh, Sorry you were just that. okay. Okay, so yeah. so this was uh, maybe for no. or something. So, so okay, okay. So there was not some. You were not doing something specific mm. there or some no 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 i mean i i just um so some giving up okay 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 so we are um, talking about the usual discreteness in the ways this is, is presented in the, in in present okay good so the second point uh the second question which is a uh, it's a uh, i think it's very much related to what francesca was doing i think it's it's it's, it's, it's along her lines um uh, let me put it this way. Uh, first, let me sharpen one thing that Francesco was saying. There's, a, there's one discreteness in the theory that is to, um, to use the spin network basis. Uh, but in a sense, that's not the discreteness we're talking about. The discreteness we're talking about is the fact that in the spin network, uh, the area and the volumes of the pieces of space is discrete. Um, I think that that's that's the distinction that uh, Francesco was stressing, and uh, and uh, it's sort of implicit in what you are saying. Uh, but I just wanted to bring a little bit more in the open, namely, um, if I use the spin networks for describe a geometry, 
and I allowed myself to have the the pieces of space, so to say, arbitrarily small uh, and an arbitrarily fine triangulation, I, I would just be doing standard Riemannian geometry in in some approximation and using some some some, some limit. So. Uh, I, I would just say, okay, I'm just approximating to some scale, but in fact, there are more degrees of freedom, which are just, um, the, the discrete of space comes about not because uh, of the spin natural picture by itself, but because in the spin natural picture, you cannot take uh, areas of volumes arbitrary small. I mean, you do the calculation and you have a, so that's, that's somehow uh, a, a, a key point. And, uh, um, but, and, and I come to, we, we agree here, right? We, yes, we'll, yes. We'll I, that. I, I remember, yes. Okay. And now we come to, to one point. It's from the point, somehow, uh, and that's one thing that Francesca was saying. You, you seem to be ignoring quantum theory, so to say. <laughs> uh, you talk as if it was classical theory. Uh, quantum theory is not about how things are. It's about depending on your interpretation of quantum theory. What do you measure or how do things interact or whatever? So for instance, suppose you have a pendulum, right? A standard one-dimensional pendulum and uh, you do the calculation about the energy and you find out that the energy is quantized. So you say the motion of this pendulum, I can view it as zero, the back of one quantum, two quantum, three quantum. Uh, now this is exactly the calculation that gives us particles in quantum field theory. Right, you take a you take a, um, a field in a box. You ex expand in Fourier modes, just classical thing. Then X Fourier mode is a, it's, it has a different quanta. Um, now, are, are this quanta part of the ontology of uh, what what is the because you describe the ontology here? What is the ontology we assign uh, to? To the system. So, in other words, your description, your, your, your addressing quantum gravity needs first to have a, an answer to the question: How do we address quantum mechanics? <laughs> very, very mm -hmm. simply, mm -hmm. um, how do I see the discrete of the energy in the ontology of a, par of a quantum particle or a mode of the of the uh, um, uh, electromagnetic field uh, in in uh, in a box? Now. The reason this is relevant is because uh, we're exactly talking about the same thing. So we're talking about the gravitational field at the classical entity we're describing. The gravitational field uh, manifests itself by interacting with matter through clocks and rods or whatever. And, and when it manifests itself, uh, uh, the way it manifests itself can be captured by quantities like the energy of a pendulum. And these quantities turn out to be discrete. So from this perspective, uh, um, it's hard to me to then go back and to say, what is the entity I'm talking about? Is it spatially extended or not? Or the same question in another, in another way. Quantum mechanics uh, is given in Hilbert space with a set of observables uh, that uh, don't choose by themselves a preferred basis. So uh, you are essentially choosing a basis, fine. Okay, and let's now analyze, uh, let's say that the eigenvalue of this basis are the ontology. That's essentially what you're saying. But this is a particular take of the theory. I can choose a different basis and then things will be completely different. Uh, do, you have, do you have an answer to that? Um, I don't think I have, an, I have several comments, but it's not really yeah. an answer. I mean, I mean, the only other answer I could say would be, I don't know, but <laughs> I would try to make a few hopefully no, no, okay. interesting okay. points. Right, so I think one interesting question is uh, the order of, order of priority of um, uh, the, um, right, we have two issues, the measurement problem, how to interpret quantum mechanics, quantum physics in general, and we have the problem of space-time emergence, right? Uh, not everyone agree on which of the two problems is more fundamental methodologically, right? Um, I think it makes perfect, I mean, if we were able to sort out the ontology of quantum mechanics and, 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 and from that to build a theory of quantum gravity, that would be great. Um, so that would be ideal. And why I'm saying that, because of course, if we were, if we were to agree 
on how to think of quantum uh, phenomena, then it will help to deal with the quantum aspect of the theory of quantum gravity. Yeah. Um, uh, another option that I, well, I was basically pretending that it was possible to talk about uh, the problem of the emergence of space time without taking uh, a position on the right ontology of quantum mechanics. Um, I mean, my, my, I'm personally agnostic. I mean, I'm not uh, knowledgeable enough to, I mean, I'm generally a skeptic in philosophy. So for me, it's quite hard to commit myself to, to any particular uh, view. Um, but um, I mean, so I mean, I, I would make a second comment. I mean, perhaps it, it's perhaps it related to what you said, and if not, sorry. Um, but I was thinking about um, if you take. Um, When you talk about extended simples, right, you are considering the spatial and temporal dimensions, right? But you are not really considering uh, the modal dimension or the quantum dimension. I mean, calling the quantum dimension model is already a particular uh, interpretation, right? But um, I mean, in a way, for instance, you can have a, a many world interpretation. I mean, even if it's false, you can use that as a way to, to put all the options on the table. Uh, to consider them. Um, and then you can ask, is this quantum dimension discrete or continuous, right? And, and it seems that the big problem is that it's, it seems to be continuous, right? And so many defenders of the many world interpretations have issues with that. It's, it's, it seems that the number of worlds of branches is not, uh, uh, um, there is no finite number of, of branch branches. Um, so it's one way perhaps of the problem of, of extension and divisibility might also come into the picture when you uh, want to introduce quantum mechanics. Um, but I don't have any unique answer about how, what would be the right way to think about extended symbols in the quantum context. Um, but I agree that if you, I mean, it's quite hard to get to the ontology through uh, uh, when you have a system described by, by vectors in the Hilbert space, um, um, are we going to really get to the ontology? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, right, so just the idea yeah. that came to mind. Uh, yeah, no, uh, we're not in disagreement. Uh, somehow we're just pointing out that uh, de facto you're really here. I mean, of course, I'm not asking you to give you a convincing solution of, of the ontology of quantum mechanics by itself, right? But, uh, but you're using one. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. You're, you're assuming one. So what, which is fine. Uh, that's the right thing to do. So let's, inter let's interpret quantum mechanics in one way. Well, it just doesn't matter. And uh, in the, at the light of this, um, discuss the problem of the extended simples. That's somehow what, what's going on. And, and it seems to me what, what you're saying here, uh, let's say that I, 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 I take the Hilbert space of quantum gravity, I look at it in a basis, which is fine. So I'm, I, I, I'm thinking I'm measuring space time in this manner. I'm measuring volume areas and so on. That's fine. So this fixes the basis. There are some, and instead of having a continuous space time, I have something finally discrete. Can I interpret this in terms of extended simplices? I just wanted to remark that there is, a, there is an underlying assumption about quantum mechanics here, which is okay, mm -hmm. but it's there. It's, uh, would you agree with that? And then I go to the, to the main question that I wanted to, <laughs> to get to. Mm. I mean, I would have to think uh, more about that. So, so, so the, the assumption would be uh, that we fix a preferred basis to-, to um... No, that's what you're doing. I'm saying what I read you to do, to do. because you, you, you're saying what are the fundamental ingredients? I mean, if, if you open a, a book of Luke Quantum Gravity, fundamental ingredients is, is a Hilbert space and a set of operators. Mm -hmm. So there's no Hilbert space, there's no, there's nothing called space time, there's nothing called, uh, 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 called extension, there's nothing, but you want something more. You, you say, okay, let's, I, I'm looking at this from a 
the in a given basis, which, which is perfectly fine. I mean, I can do the quantum mechanics of a particle and think this, I look at the basis of the, on the particle basis. So that's talking about a particle in a position space. Uh, excuse what me, is that uh, if I... Carlo, can't we uh, invoke the coherence to explain why? Yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. No, it's mm -hmm. fine. I mean, you think I, I, uh, I look at that basis, assuming that I'm decoering that basis, measuring that basis, mm -hmm. that, that's fine. But, but mm -hmm. there is a choice. I wouldn't say there is a choice. It's, it's like mm -hmm. the pendulum. If I think uh, in terms of measuring the amplitudes, I get something continuous because the amplitude here is a quantum mechanical operator with continuous spectrum. If I think about measuring the, uh, sorry, the, the position as a continuous spectrum, but the energy doesn't have a continuous spectrum, has a discrete spectrum. So they're both true, so that one is more less true than the other. But let me let me go to the uh, 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 let me go to, to to the main point, Baptist, because this is what I I found most interesting. And here, uh, you know, I I never know. I I really liked your your ways of organizing the possibilities. And I never know when I don't understand if this I I don't get sufficiently the subtleties of your philosophical thinking, which certainly happens, uh, um, or. I or or is something that I see from a different perspective. Um, the thing that uh, I guess confuses me, and 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 uh, uh, I think I, I think that the way I think about this story is the third one, the last one, the grounding one. Uh, it seems to me, uh, if if I try to read myself in terms of what you're saying, um, because if I listen to you. What happens to me is that all along the your discussion, my the physicist Kagler want to say, what do you mean by extension? What do you mean by space time? Uh, why do you keep asking if there is a space time? What what is a space time? Uh, why, Baptist, do you assume you know what is a space time to start with, or why do you know you you seem to know what is extension to to start with? So there is a sense in which, and, and you, you pinpointed very cleanly, in which the, uh, the elementary nodes, the so-called quanta of space of low quantum gravity, are not extended. And I think you, you zoomed on it. Yes, they're not extended in some sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but then what I mean by, by extension, assuming that the world is truly described by loop quantum gravity, okay, maybe it's not, but if it is, if it is described by loop quantum gravity, then, uh, the language I would use, uh, and maybe this is the th your third option, is uh, when I talk about extension in general relativity, what I'm really talking about is not uh, what is described by mathematical continuity of, 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 uh, of differential manifold, but is what is described by you know counting discrete things mm -hmm. uh, in a limit in which I don't see the discreteness uh, anymore. So this is sort of a Riemann uh, in the famous lecture in which he, you know, he talked about the geometry and then said, wait a moment, what, what gives geometry to space? I mean, what is it? It should be something else. And then his idea was the most natural thing that could be something else uh, is just, it's counting. So in, in a sense, in his super famous lecture, what, what, what Riemann said, that the only, he overstressed it. The only reasonable interpretation we have about extension is that it is discrete. It is counting of things. Um, and in fact, his mathematics is, is about that because he has an object, which is the, uh, the metric tensor, the Riemann tensor, which is put on top of the continuous manifold uh, uh, to, to, to give a meaning to it about uh, uh, length and, 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 and area to give a geometry. Um, so once you separate this notion of extension uh, uh, in, in, into, into these two levels, uh, what Riemann is saying, uh, it seems to be that the only reasonable way this could come about is by counting elementary things. Uh, and then independently, a uh, hundred years later, quantum mechanics tells, well, in fact, it is, if you just do the quantum physics of, uh, of area and you, you get the same thing. So uh, I equivocate on the meaning of words. 
uh, it seemed to me that by space time, we mean something which is approximately described by a continuous, but de facto formed about by indivisible and simplest cis, which do I want to call it extended? No, but then it's a terminological thing. No, because in the definition you have, they don't have parts. Uh, but yes, in the sense that is extension equal one, and then you have extension equal two being two, extension equal three. Am I am I completely out of, am I missing your subtleties here? I mean, that's very interesting. I mean, I guess I want to write two, two ways. First, first, I mean, what you said at, the, at the, the last part about counting, I mean, I mean, it's quite close to what I like. I mean, I like the idea that space, even if space time uh, exists, emerge in existing, um, if LQG is a right tree, I think it makes sense to think of the emerging space time as being discrete and just as being approximated as being continuous because uh, I don't trust the mathematics. I think we project some structure on top of the world, which is not there. Um, but for the, con for the content part, I mean, I think strictly speaking, it's also consistent with uh, eliminativism about space time, right? As long as you can basically build up uh, agents being able to count, uh, it will be possible. So actually, I'm working on, on developing this view too that we called um, recover some kind of empirical coherence, we explain how we live in a phenomenal world and make science without space time. And I think we need something like that, counting, causal interactions. Um, so maybe surprisingly, what, what you just said made me think that uh, your view might be consistent with the three views that I sketch out. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, I mean, maybe. And, and the reason why uh, I prefer personally using composition that grounding between the two, well, it's a bit like, you know, in philosophy of mind, people debate about whether consciousness should be reduced to a physical state, whether they're identical, whether it's, we should be dualist and have two sorts of things. Um, I have not only naturalist inclinations, but also more monist. Uh, in, in inclination, I like to try to minimize my ontology. So I think I quite, I think it's quite appealing to try to uh, yeah. close the gap, right? The explanatory gap between the non-spatial temporal and the spatial temporal. So the reason why I'm trying to use this kind of strange relation of composition is basically to have a, a minimal ontology and and try to, to close the gap. Because if you go on the primitive grounding uh, side. My issue is that I've really the impression it's just like if you were to reify consciousness. Say you have the physical ah. world, you have numerically distinct conscious agents that are not really physical, not completely physical at least. And I guess I have the same intuition. I want to basically unreify the levels. So there is just one level of reality. Uh, perhaps we have a final theory of physics that will explain everything. Probably not. I mean, I don't know. Who knows? But it would be um i want to try to develop a, a, an ov uh, overall framework in which you don't have many levels with different sorts of uh, entities almost autonomous so my, my reason to prefer um uh, composition over grounding is that right and to me it seems yeah. that what you just said it seems that you also have a kind of inclination to to yeah. close the gap right yeah so if you want to close the gap i mean uh, I, I guess I will try to convince you that uh, um, composition is, is, is great too and perhaps better. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, sorry, I'm getting yeah, yeah, excited. Yeah, yeah, no, you're, 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 you're convincing. You're very convincing. So thank you. I, now I also understand better. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, you, and and I, I, I really learned from all that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Uh, next in line, we have uh, Byung Uki, who asked me in the chat to ask a question, so please go ahead. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Well, and thank you very much for the talk. Uh, so I, I have a, two very naive questions and the one a bit less naive, and I wonder whether anything is worth raising, but here is a very, the most naive question. Just be, before you, even you uh, get into the issue, I have some background question. Uh, the question is whether, uh, it is reasonable to think that there are extended symbols, but before the contemporary physical theory, 
if we go back, the old theories like the Greek theory of atoms or Dalton's theory of atom, or even the contemporary quantum theory, as it is naively understood, uh, isn't it fair to say that in those theories, uh, so it is natural to take them to accept ex extended samples? So, for example, if you simply go to the atom, the, the Greek atomic theory. And so atoms are, have no parts. And secondly, they, are, they have non-zero extension. And so, so if, if that is correct, then is, it, is the question arising here uh, focusing simply on whether even the, contempt, the contemporarily explored theories uh, postulate extended samples? Or, or is it more like the, so, so only if you accept the, 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 the more recent theories, then you would need to accept the extended samples. So I was just, a, this is just a question about the background to, right. to, the, to the current issue. Right, right, thank you very much. Um, the reason why I'm focusing on those uh, theories of quantum gravity and, and, and other people have been is that, um, but yeah, think of theories as like some kind of probes to probe reality, right? And, and the more we advance with scientific progress, the, the better our theories get, and, and we have a better understanding of the limitations of our previous theories. Um, extended simples are basically spatial temporal things, right? They have to do with extension uh, and with space, right? So it makes sense to look at the theories in physics that have something to say about uh, space time, about space and time more generally. And, 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 and the place to go if you look at contemporary theories is uh, special and general theories of relativity, uh, but which, is, which are also limited. So we, we, we need to get a sense on how, of how we are going to combine that with, with quantum uh, theories. So it means looking at series of quantum gravity, like uh, uh, loop quantum gravity. But of course, they are um, work in progress series. But in my mind, they seem like the right place to, to look, even if it's incredible, inc incredibly difficult to get some results, uh, some philosophical uh, uh, results. Uh, so that's the reason why I was um, looking at those theories. Yes, yes, thank you. OK, that gives me a background. Uh, the next two questions are somewhat related. So maybe if I will, so I guess, uh, yeah, I, I, I like your general point that it is quite hard to draw some metaphysical or ontological uh, uh, conclusions out of uh, uh, physical theories in general, especially when the theories are not have, have not been fully worked out. But I but 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 on the other hand, uh, so but part of the message is that uh, the kind of theories that you are if you are considering the kind of theories that you are considering, it's not clear that they have, they will postulate space-time. Space-time might either not exist at all, or space-time only exists uh, as uh, derivative entities or, and so on. Uh, so if that, so I guess that, so, and then you are saying that the notion of extended simple is a controversial because extended extended part is a controversial extended part of a controversial. Here it seems that uh, you are tying the notion of extension to space time, uh, especially the realism about space time. But that so I, when I thought about it, so that's the way that I would have thought because I would have thought that extended mm -hmm. means that spread out in space. Okay, and but that. But, but on the other hand, the space-time substantivalism really, it has not always been, uh, I was reminded, the orthodox view. And so uh, there is a famous Leibniz-Newton uh, debate. And so here, in this case, uh, one can naively read uh, Leibniz as holding that space-time do not exist or space-times are not fundamental entities. They exist. If they exist, they they exist only in relations. So in their case, if we have Leibniz's view, 
uh, does Leibniz have some difficulties in having the notion of extension or even the notion of extended simple? Uh, in this case, I came to think that probably no. It's one thing to say that space-time Leibniz and Leibniz do, does do not exist or exist as only derivative entities as uh, relations uh, arising as relations of space tempor spatial temporal relations among material objects. It's another thing to say that there is no notion of, uh, the notion of extend, extension or being extended is arising out of a spatial temporal relation. Why? Because uh, I, so th I think there is one notion of extension, uh, which is the notion of, uh, related to the notion of volume or area or length. So the extended things are the things that have non-zero length or non-zero area or non-zero volume. And so I, so, well, if you have the, you already assume the notion of space time or space, you can reduce all those uh, uh, measures of volumes or areas or lengths to the measures of the space time that a material object occupies. And so, so then, so, so I, I would gather that Leibniz uh, can have the notion of non-zero volume independently of the, how he constructs the space time out of the material objects and their relations. And so uh, then I, so, so here, so that's my background. And if that's mm -hmm. so, if you think of the kind of theories that you are developing, so these theories may or may not accept the existence of space time as, a, as entities at all, or they may end up uh, accepting the existence of space time as only derivative entities. But do they have some independent, will they, but can they have some independent notion of uh, uh, area or volume or to area of volume? So measure of area of volume. And do they arise also the, the, the comparative measures of area and the volume? So one thing, uh, one thing larger than another. Can they have that kind of notions, or is it unclear that if, even that kind of notion is problematic for those kind of theories? Thank you very much. Um, yes. Um, Right, so, so there are many things to say here. So the first thing I want to say is that um, the debate between relationism and substantivalism about uh, space or space-time, um, I think can be put uh, uh, aside, right? Because um, if you want to be, to deny the fundamentality of space-time, most of the time you want to, to go further than simply being relationist about uh, space-time. Uh, this being said, I think you are right that uh, Leibniz uh, and actually also Kant have uh, uh, interesting stuff to say about uh, this issue. Um, so actually Leibniz is not only a relationist about time and space time, but he is also endorsing a partial theory, uh, causal, causal theory of, of time uh, uh, and space. So uh, what it means is that if you have Leibniz, uh, Leibniz point of view, um, uh, it's it should be possible to um, um, oh no for Leibniz. So Leibniz has, has a different stories for simultaneity relations and, 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 and posteriority relations. Um, so I think he has a causal theory only for one of the two sorts of, re of, of, of relations. Uh, so, so use the principles of sufficient reason for um, the um, uh, posteriority relations, right? X, some kind of... Uh, Sorry, uh, I'm not a Leib Leibniz scholar, but I just gave. Oh, so, sorry, I said you were. So I, was trying yeah, to I just relate. gave it as a, as a as a background, as a motivating one. And but my question was not about Leibniz or Kant or anything. But my question was uh, out of my so out of my ignorance. So it is the the question is whether uh, the kind of the contemporary theory that you are discussing. Whether those theories can have the idea of non-zero length or non-zero area or non-zero volume 
uh, independently of uh, postulating the space and time? Or can they have such notions only, oh. if, they, only if they have constructed or have accepted? Right, right, time? right. I see, I think. Well, I, I, I mean, I don't know. For me, it's a bit uh, um, a terminological question. I mean, how are you going to define the notions of extension, volume, uh, distance? Are you going to tie this notion to uh, the ordinary yes. space time of, of general relativity that we measure with rods and clocks, right? Uh, or can you be a bit more liberal and basically free? The notion of extension to this from this space. Yes, that, uh, that will be a bit um, strange, but perhaps it's possible. I mean, one one possibility would be to have many spaces and say, "Well, look, we live in one space, but all of our, our vocabulary that we use to describe volumes, eras in our ordinary space uh, would work also for other spaces uh, with a different structure, or at least partially, right? So perhaps there is room for something like that, where you say, "Well, look." Uh, perhaps there is a, a deeper structure. It's not exactly space. It differs from our space in many different ways. But with some conceptual revisions, we can still use some concepts of extensions or distance uh, in the fundamental ontology, although they, they don't have exactly the same properties. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very interesting and, and difficult question. I think it's a very good one. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, do I have time for one more quick question? Uh, yes, if that's quick, you have time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hopefully this is a quick question. Hopefully this is a, a more uh, less naive question. Uh, this is about, uh, so it's a related question, but this is about your meteorological space-time uh, realism and uh, in connection with the uh, existence of extended simple. In this case, you so you asked the you raised the case of uh, as I understand it, uh, spatial time region, which is uh, which is uh, in some sense to be called extended. But on the other hand, it is a simple in one sense, uh, in the sense that it doesn't have any spatial temporal part. But mm -hmm. it is not in simple in another sense. In that, in, on this view, it is a composed is a composed of non-spatial temporal parts. So I agree that if you have that kind of thing, it is it is uh, weird to call them uh, extended simple because the simple part is controversial. But here, uh, if you have that kind of view, on top of that view, meteorological space time realism, where you have uh, spatial temporal reason that does not have any spatial temporal part, but it's but still it's extended. On top of that, view, if you hold that there is a, there are some particles or some non-spatial temporal entities which is occupying uh, on exactly one spatial one simple spatial temporal reason in that sense, and it has no part. So it is a, the simplicity is not issue, but in that case it is a, it has an extent, but it is extended for in whatever sense that you are assuming. In that case, would, so if you. Uh, would that be one possible way of accepting extended simples in the in the robust sense? Mm, I, I'm not entirely sure. I, I followed entirely the end. So, uh, so I mean, could you could you repeat the last part? Yeah. So here is the question. So, so in in extended uh, meteorologic meteorological space uh, space time realism. Mm -hmm. So you are willing to accept the existence of a spatial temp simple spatial temporal reason, which is one extended, but two, uh, but is in but it is simple in one sense, but not simple in another sense. Simple in the sense that it does not have any smaller uh, and it, it does not have any uh, any smaller uh, spatial temporal part. That's a sim spatial temporal is simple. But second, but it's not completely simple because it has uh, non-spatial temporal parts. Did I catch your view correctly? Yeah, you could think, for instance, of a space yeah. on point, right? Space on point yeah. made of, of, of yeah. uh, qualitative or neutral properties. Or for instance, but it cannot be a point because you said that it's extended. So I take that point is not extended. So it's, it's that's why I use the word. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> So I, yes, uh, yes. So if you have such a kind of reasons, so it's, let's call them uh, extended uh, quasi-simples, quasi-simple reason, right? 
Okay. Mm -hmm. But but you can on, on in that kind of view, uh, you I wonder whether you can have the notion of extended uh, genuine simples. That is, there, there is a material object. So my pen, my pen is so let's my pen or atom or whatever park is uh, is uh, is occupying exactly one of those extended quasi simple regions of space and time. And the secondly, it's a simple. In that case. Would it be reasonable to say that that's a genuine extended simple, not in the diluted sense? I mean, I don't know how what, what you want. I mean, depending on how you define um, genuine. I mean, I mean, genuine, I think genuine. there is a matter of, of terminological flexibility. Yeah, simple, simple. I am using the word simple in the uh, in the, in the sense that it has no part whatsoever, no proper part whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm just saying that I think we have some flexibility about how we are going to name the new, uh, the new strange entities that we may have to postulate because of of, of QG. Do you, do you have? Uh, how about uh, strings? So I, I assume that we are talking about uh, string theories. If string theories must accept, uh, must uh, so if string theory is uh, combined with. Uh, uh, meteorological uh, space-time realism on your view, for whatever reason, it might occupy one space spatial temporal reason. And then the spatial temporal reason that it occupies might be a, might be uh, an extended quasi simple spatial temporal reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, if a string is a simple entity with, with no proper part, then would we not get a case? So, so it yeah, it depends on a lot of if ifs and assumptions. But we are exploring the possibility of extended uh, the notion of extended simple in in the in the strong uh, string theory framework and so on. So then would we not getting uh, the notion of an extended simple in that kind of framework? That was the question. Yeah, perhaps. I mean, I, I will have to think uh, uh, more about it. Uh, okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. That's all. Thanks, thanks. Uh, next in line, we have Tomasz Bigay. Tomasz, please go ahead. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, I have a slight problem with the idea of mariology that is not based on uh, uh, spatial temporal uh, uh, parts. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, originally, historically, mariology was considered to be like a, a theory of, of, of the relation, part and whole relation in, in relations to space and time. Mm -hmm. Now, you gave an example of uh, uh, supposedly that in, in which we could use uh, those uh, non spatial temporal parts, like uh, uh, we could consider uh, physical objects as being mirological uh, compositions of their properties. But I, I have doubts regarding this example because it seems to me that it's much more natural to consider uh, objects in this uh, sort of like bundle theory of properties as as being a, a sort of uh, a, a, a sort of uh, uh, sets in the set theoretical uh, uh, distributive sense uh, of, of properties. And why is it so? Because the main difference between mirrorology, mirrorological sets, and uh, and distributive sets is that in mirrorology you can take uh, two elements of a, a mirrorological set put them together, and this will be yet another element of the neurological set, but this doesn't work in, in, yeah. in, in but, but in, in the case of, of physical objects, I mean, if you take two properties and put them together as a, as a composition, a neurological, they will not right. create a property. So it seems to me that the structure, structurally speaking, it is more like a this like, like a distributive set rather than neurological. Yeah, so, there, is, there is an answer to that, actually. It's like, so that, I mean, actually, uh, uh, so one, so, so basically the view was developed by Low Ripple, and uh, it touches on the debate about, about the nature of properties, right? Tropes or universals. And in fact, if you have the magical bundle theory, you just have one properties of each sort. So in fact, if it's not possible to uh, to uh, to take one trope of red, another trope of of, of red, and, and and ask whether it's there is something more. There is just one drop of red in the world. So basically, all the red objects in this view uh, are made by combination of this one drop of red with uh, all the locations of the different objects. 
because it's an ontology where basically space time is is um, is broken into location pre properties, right? So um, so you um, when basically properties compose with other properties to give object. So it's a restrictivist view about uh, composition. So uh, some properties connect to other to some properties and not to other properties. And depending on the on your list of the connection uh, uh, between the fundamental properties, you get the objects. Um, uh, right. So okay. so. Mm -hmm. so, so did I make progress on the question or, or did I miss? Uh, well, I, I'm not familiar with this particular com, uh, you know, conception, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it, it seems to me a little bit uh, strange. I'm kind of uh, used to the idea that mirology uses uh, objects of the same sort of ontological category. Like, like you, you compose, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the whole that is composed of some smaller parts belongs to the same ontological category. Right. But here you have different categories. You have either right. tropes or properties on the right. one hand, and, and physical objects on the other. So I, I don't see how they mirrorologically you can create one out of the other. That, that, that's right. my, my problem. Right, right. I mean, it depends how, what, what you think is mirrorology, right? I mean, uh, I mean, you're perfectly right. I mean, myself, I have some uh, naturalist, uh, nominalist inclinations. So I'm actually, I'm a realist about properties to be anti-realist about objects and, and, and many steps, right? Because also I like quantum fields and I like an ontology of properties. So uh, I, I have also this kind of inclination, and I, I really preferred mirrorology of a set theory exactly for the reason that I, I didn't like the empty set, right? So, so I quite like mirrorology for that. But no, um, I don't think that if you look at, at a formal mirrorology, um, there is nothing that forces you to stipulate that the parts and the holes have to belong to the same ontological category. So my answer to you will be that, well, it's our natural way to, to add, interpret mirrorology, right? Because it's based on our common sense intuitions about uh, objects composing other objects, particles composing stuff. Um, but um, what I'm trying to say is that we can keep that as a, as a particular um, case of a broader frame, framework where it doesn't have to be like that all the time, uh, even though we came to develop our, our mirrorological intuitions uh, in relation to the more common case, um, common sense, common sense uh, cases, right? So, I mean, I agree there is something a bit strange or counterintuitive to think about mirrorology like this. Uh, but anyway, we, we have to find some um, um, counterintuitive tools or, or, or notions if we want to uh, relate the spatial temporal to the non-spatial temporal. I mean, at, le at least that would be my uh, expectation. And so if you don't have anything in the formalities that prevent you to do that, that's great. But to be honest, so in the other paper with Sam that I mentioned, um, we, we but it has a, so, uh, two parts. So the first part, um, low repulse mirrorological bundle theory is fine when it comes to the formalism. It, it's, it's really mirrorology. But when you want to apply that to more uh, context from quantum gravity, um, and you want to say that uh, you can have trans-categorical composition uh, with, for instance, spin networks composing uh, an object, uh, you have to let go some um, some uh, plausible uh, plausible principles that you would like to keep, like harmony principle was one, uh, the Don Hardly um, inheritance of location. Uh, so we have, you have basically to sever some properties that we usually ascribe to mirrorology to make it work. Uh, but that's in a way the game, right? Because you, you will have to find some notion. I mean, perhaps, perhaps there are other ways to go. But for me personally, the, the fact that it's not exactly uh, mirrorology as we usually conceive of it, it's okay if, if we find a tool. I'm really after a tool to make sense of, of the situation. Okay. okay, thank you. That, 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 that explains a lot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your question. Peter, you're the next. So my question relates uh, somewhat to Carlo's third question, and uh, your response actually headed in the direction of, a, of something I'd like to also see from you, which is 
some slightly more connection to the phenomenal of the level, to the experimental level. Uh, obviously, your paper and this talk both relate to the relationship between uh, metaphysics and a particular two particular theories. And uh, particularly, um, it seems to me that something might be made of um, the question of how we coordinate experiments and results, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, when an experimentalist describes an experiment to other experimentalists, they say, oh, well, I had this piece of apparatus set up like this. I had this piece of apparatus set up like this. I connected them in this particular way. And uh, to some extent, that description is all in space time. But there's also an element of, uh, they will say, oh, and I used this particular kind of detector, which I bought off the shelf from this manufacturer. And uh, in an experimentalist sense, that kind of black box has its inputs and its outputs. Uh, in many ways, that is an extended simple. From the experimentalist point of view, it really is, because they don't know how it works inside. I mean, they have some idea, of course, but nonetheless, they haven't worked on the engineering of that object. They haven't constructed it. They use it as a black box. They trust that its output will be what it, what it should be. Although there will be details, things like they'll say to, uh, to, their, to their experimentalist friends, oh, I actually drove it with a slightly higher voltage than, than the specs said, because I found I got slightly better performance out of it by doing precisely this difference. So precise differences in how a piece of apparatus that ostensibly is a black box is, makes a big difference. And of course, measuring precisely how much difference there is between the apparatus as you describe it and the apparatus that someone else in another laboratory has constructed exactly how the two things are different matters are hugely as to whether you can reproduce the results of the experiment. So experimentalists have to have some concept of how far one measurement device is from another. And of course, that gets you into how precisely they coordinate the relationships between the components of their apparatus and how that relates to the coordinates of, of some other person, some other experimentalist apparatus. And this all boils down, I think, to the whole, the whole literature and, and the, the whole um, establishment of metrology, which goes back to hundreds of years. Uh, and when, so the, the reference I particularly have always loved is, uh, is um, Hazard Chang's book, uh, Inventing Temperature, uh, where he really discusses the ways in which 19th century uh, physicists particularly constructed what essentially comes it becomes a continuous measure of temperature, where in the beginning it was uh, it, it's perhaps not quite so much. Well, no, in many ways it is always a continuous measure, except that the ways that is, is reply the way that you tell other people what the temperature is is always discrete because you know you say thirty seven degrees Celsius or thirty seven point two, but you don't say square root of two is the temperature and so on. Um, so all your reports of what you did in the past, all your description of the experiment is always discrete in that sense. It's always to six significant figures or whatever it may be. And next year it will be to 10 significant figures and the year after that it'll be to, to 11 significant figures or whatever it may be. Um, and yet in the future, you anticipate that there's a continuum of what you might be able to do in the future. So the past is in many ways discrete all the reports, and this is of course formal physics, whereas what you might do in the future, you say, well, I'm going to do something in between what those two other experimentalists did, or I'm going to do something that's outside of what they did, an extrapolation rather than an interpolation. And which it is that you say your experiment is going to do matters enormously. So obviously all of that coordinatization is usually premised on uh, a, a space-time, uh, and if you were going to do local quantum physics and, and sort of uh, a, a Whiteman sort of quantum field theory sort of approach, you would coordinatize using uh, uh, spaces of functions on, on phase space, on a space-time. So now you still have topologies for, and also metrics, distances, on the space of descriptions of experiments. This is becoming an infinite dimensional uh, space-time, so to speak, 
but of course it's constructed in terms of an actually three plus one dimensional space time or, or possibly a higher dimensional thing. So all this is really to say is that I, I kind of like to see, because in your response to Carlo, it, it seems to me that you actually did step towards that kind of analysis of how your Mariology would work for the real case, so to speak, for the actual ones, twos, and threes, I think was, uh, was the way that uh, Carlo put it in his third question. Uh, and you responded fairly positively to that. So it, it, I'm not really necessarily expecting an answer from you immediately because this does take you away from the, uh, the real ontology and metaphysics of the paper and of this talk. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'd like to encourage you, I suppose, to, uh, to, to go in that direction uh, insofar as you want to. <laughs> yes. Right, no, thank you, that's very interesting. I mean, um, I guess what you just described, I would refer to that as what I would call phenomenal space and phenomenal time or oper mm -hmm. operationalist time and operationalist space, what clocks and words measures mm -hmm. or, or maybe some ticks and some, some um, coordinating techniques. Uh, so all of that have to be accounted for, of course. I'm not denying that. Yes. So, so my view is that accounting for that actually is um, um, a condition for a good account of, of the metaphysics of the emergence of space-time. So if you have a view that does not allow you to explain how we have this phenomenal space, phenomenal time, uh, how we are able to make measurements uh, and, and, and coordinate ourselves as a community to, to account for past measurements and anticipate and, and make predictions, uh, we have to do that. Actually, in, in the literature, they call uh, that the problem of empirical coherence. So we need to have some coherence between the fundamental strange theory and the and the and all the informations, observations, experience that we used to get to the theory, right? So that's that's a problem. If if your theory put at risk, even in operational space and operational time, then you are in trouble. Right. So for me, that's something you have to account for. My own view is that the three approaches I just at can uh, give you a story of that. Right. So perhaps the most um, challenging view will be the eliminativist approach. We say, well, but if you really think that there is no space time at all, right? How are you going to give me uh, all those coordination, all those um, phenomenal? Uh, observation in, located in space and time, right? So my, my answer will be that you will need something else. And this something else might be sufficiently close to um, our ordinary notion of space and time that you might want to say, well, your space time eliminativist is not that eliminativist because what's real are the things that implement those possibilities, right? So you have all this, um, I mean, I mean, David Chalmers has an interesting paper on that in, in, in the book I'm, I'm co-editing, uh, where he, he discussed functionalism um, in this context, right? If you think that basically space and just is what um, space and time are just this kind of things that allows, a, allows us to make uh, experiments and observations, etc., well, then it has to be real, right? Uh, so that will be a bit of a bit on what you are going which direction you are going to, 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 to go. Um, but I think it's fair to say that there is still room for a very eliminativist view about space and time, saying something like, uh, it will be in the spirit of, of Kant, uh, which, which was a different um, a proponent of the causal theory of uh, time. And you can say, well, maybe what we need is address causal interactions, like relations of dependence between entities. And from that, you can basically build up um, space and time. So that would be, there is one option that would be to say, well, I'm fully realist about causal, ca causal relations between natural entities, but what we call space and time uh, are really fictions that target some patterns in the causal relations, something like that. That would be one way to go. If I may, um, I'll, I'd, I'd just encourage you to, uh, to in future think about how uh, a, a really sort of the experimentalist black box, which is cannot be separated into parts, is similar to an extended simple or not. 
Um, right, but I mean, it doesn't fit with the ordinary, I mean, ordinary, it's not a philosophical concept of, of extended simple, I guess, um, because your black box, uh, are ha it, it has parts, right? Your lack of knowledge of, of the parts or what's inside will not be usually taken as, um, as allowing a categorization of the black yeah. book as being so that an extended be simple. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it, I guess extended simple are really at the level of what there is, the ontological level. And I guess the point you make is more about the epistemology, what we know or don't know, right? And, and extended simples are not epistemological notions, they are really ontological notions, I think. Right. And finally, referring to what Tomas uh, said, um, it seems to me there's, uh, there's a quite different kind of muriology, which is the muriology of algorithms. That's to say, you can construct algorithms in many, many different ways, but actually constructing a partial orderings and so on on algorithms, computer programs that you put into uh, your Turing machine or whatever, is, is rather different from the kinds of uh, orderings that one puts on uh, space, space time. And in fact, those are important in physics uh, because uh, transformations of uh, our experimental results are very important. Uh, and, and of course, non-commutativity of algorithms is absolutely there. Uh, so there's, uh, it seems to me that there's a muriology of algorithms could also be brought into this as a, as a comparator for the muriology of space time. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I don't know it, about it, uh, this notion, but I will check it. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure you, well, I'm not aware of any literature on it. I've really constructed out of what Thomas uh, said, it brought to mind that the idea of algorithms um, and parts of algorithms, where, mm -hmm. you know, the, the ways in which people compose algorithms together uh, by, by going to uh, online repositories and so on, uh, mm -hmm. is very much in terms of black boxes, but also in terms of modifying those black boxes when they don't quite do what you want them to do and so on. So there is a parts and holes, but there's also dig digging deeper and deeper and rewriting and writing new and so on. Okay, fine. <laughs> bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for That's interesting. Yeah, bye. Um, Baptiste, are you willing to take the very last question? Because we are a bit... Uh, oh, sure, sure. I mean... Uh, uh -huh. No, okay. I can. It's a very last question, and it comes uh, from the chair himself. Right. Uh, <laughs> so um, I mainly relies on uh, uh, things that have been already already said, but I would like to focus on the uh, dependence relation that holds between a fundamental non-spatiotemporal regime and uh, space-time. Um, now, when I talk about that, in my case, I already have in the back of my head a solution to the measurement problem. Okay, so. Um, right. and, and, and of course, it's a Copenhagen. Uh... It's a Copenhagen, absolutely, it's some sort of perspectival thing. But okay, that um, aside. Um, so, first of all, you said, um, well, composition, sometimes people attack composition in, uh, as a possible dependence relation in this case because composition is uh, cast in terms of uh, uh, spatial uh, concepts, so it is not viable here. But you say, but who cares? Let's uh, uh, generalize or abstract uh, the notion of composition in order to d divorce it from spatial temporal notion. And voila, we, we have solved uh, the problem. This is something that a little bit puzzles me because, um, I mean, we can abstract uh, whatever you want. Also the notion of physical three-dimensional space, we can abstract it to encompass uh, multi-dimensional spaces, uh, possibly infinite dimensional spaces. But the fact that we can do that doesn't seem a, a warrant uh, that we can use uh, those um, abstractions as uh, physical notions as uh, the notion of three space is, uh, is uh, uh, physical. And this is my first point. The second point is uh, uh, you, you have set this uh, dichotomy uh, when you have made this uh, taxonomy of possible approaches between uh, this relation being composition or being grounding. 
But why is it so? Cannot we also consider causation in the sense that uh, if we think about the physics, so it is natural to think that this non spatial temporal regime does something active in bringing about uh, space time. Mm -hmm. But I think that the notion of grounding uh, is not enough to account uh, for this, uh, you know, physical activity of uh, bringing about uh, space time. What do you think about that? Right. So let me take the second one, perhaps, uh, first. Um, so I guess the causal, so I mean, I'm, I'm open to the causal story just gesture, and I like it, I think it's an option, but I would perhaps uh, categorize it as a form of grounding, right? So it's, it's I mean, it's content truth, of course, um, but yeah, I was, the problem of the presentation I gave you was oversimplifying, and I think causation is on the table, and, and I mean, um, why not, right? But for instance, Alastair Wilson has been discussing um, uh, how we are going to distinguish between causation and grounding, right? What's, what's the difference between those two sorts of, of building relations in a broad sense, right? And in non-spatial temporal context, it becomes really tricky, right? Because one, one way some people were defending grounding was that it was not uh, basically unfolding in time when causation was related to time, something like that. Um, but in this context, it becomes a bit even tricky to distinguish between grounding and causation, right? So, so I would just answer that uh, it's on the table. I mean, my, my labels were giving the impression I was not taking it as a serious option, but I think it is. Um, do you want to call this uh, primitive relations grounding um, or causation? Um, I mean, my view would be that it's some, it would be some kind of um, metaphysical causation or exotic form of causation that might maybe a bit uh, delicate to decide whether we want to call it causal or not. But yeah, yeah. Actually, some authors in the literature have the hypothesis that in this context that we should adopt some sort of non-standard uh, uh, dependence relation, which mm -hmm. is some sort of hybrid between right. the grounding and right right no, you're perfectly right so i think you you put the finger on the right uh, on, on the right thing i mean uh, so let's say that we we put uh, on the side eliminatives in what space time we accept that we, there is a space time and there is a dependence relation between the non spatial temporal ontology and space time um, another question you it relates to, to your, your first question will Allow me to answer to your first question. Why would we want to use composition uh, to, to, to be this relation of dependence between the two structures, right? And, and my, I think I already just said that is that, of course, I'm basically forcing it a bit, pushing it and saying, well, let's do that. And, and you can say, well, but you are just, uh, I mean, there are many partial order relations uh, it's, it's a bit cheap to just take a, a partial order relation, call it uh, exotic composition and, and let's go, right? So I, I hear, I understand that. I mean, I have been thinking about this issue for a while and, and um, I, I, feel, I feel the point of that. But um, I guess my answer will be dialectical, right? So what, what are we trying to do exactly? And what we are trying to do, I think, is, is to enhance our understanding of the situation, right? Basically make it, because some physicists even complain that it doesn't make sense to say that space-time is not fundamental, right? But it's nice if we can make sense of that, right? If you use a dependence relation, which is a bit uh, brute, that doesn't really, uh, that you have to add to your ontology, um, I think it's not as good as using something you already have, but just have to modify it a bit, right? So actually what I'm saying about composition, uh, you could apply it to causation too, saying, well, if you give me a story about, well, I'm using causation, but in some context, uh, it deviates from time uh, and space. It doesn't have already to be in space and time. Uh, that would be fine. Actually, it's also a, a line of inquiry that I like. And I'm pursuing. I guess what's really important for me is to try to find an explanatory 
an explanation, a connecting device that closes the explanatory gap, right? The, the cognitive dissonance that many of us experience when we think about, wow, we have a non-spatial temporal world and, and somehow the space-time world emerges from this. So my, my, my objective is to reduce the gap by using a notion that we already have and that we may modify a bit uh, to, to, to explain that, right? And, and, and so causation, if, if, you, if you do that with causation, that would be okay, I guess. Okay, thank you very much, Baptiste. Okay.